Oof, man, I need a haircut. Hey guys, it's Emma here and welcome back to my channel. So in this week's video, I thought I would tap into my inner cinephile because I absolutely love cinema and movies and everything to do with film. So I'm just using this week's video as an opportunity because I don't get to talk about it enough. So I thought why not dedicate a whole video to it. And I would like to talk about 10 photography movies that whether you're a photographer or artist or remotely interested in the photographic industry or you just admire film, you should absolutely watch. Now I'm not doing like a top 10 counting down from 10 to one, um, which is like the least good to the best. Like I'm not ranking them at all as that's just too much pressure. I can't be dealing with that kind of stress. I am just going to list 10 just as they are. Disclaimer before anybody kicks off and they're like, oh my God, what about that movie? Da -da -da -da. Documentary movies and documentary films I'm saving for another list. This is just purely fictional or based on true events. These are cinematic films, not documentaries. Documentary movies on photography will be a list for another time. So I think I've rambled on long enough. <laughs> Let's talk about them. These are 10 photography movies you need to watch. Number one. Blow up. So we're kicking this list off with a classic. Blow Up is one of the essential movies that you have to watch if you're remotely interested in photography, not just because it's an interesting portrait of a fictional photographer based on a real life photographer, but it's also a fascinating look into 1960s London, which was also referred to as Swinging London. So in this 1966 cult classic, David Hemmings plays a photographer named Thomas, inspired by real life photographer David Bailey. He works in a cool studio in London, he frolics around with models. While out on a walk in his local park, Thomas starts taking pictures of two lovers in secret. Upon developing the images back in his studio, he realises that he's actually captured a murder on film. I don't want to talk too much about it because it's something that you need to see. There's not... I, I don't want to talk about it without giving away anything. But safe to say, it's a really interesting film. And it paints a really cool portrait of London in the 60s. There's this gig with the Yardbirds performing, parties where people are taking drugs, and then you've got these young Twiggy type models turning up at a studio wanting to be famous. There's a lot that goes on in this movie, but if you're interested in photography, I would highly recommend checking this movie out. Number two. Pekka. Pekka is an unusual movie. <laughs> Released in 1998 and set in the titular character's hometown of Baltimore, the movie follows a young teenage boy who is obsessed with taking pictures. When I say obsessed, I mean he's fixated. He spends about five minutes photographing a burger that he's supposed to be making for a customer at work. It's almost absurd how addicted this kid is to his camera. The teenage photographer is discovered by a New York gallery owner. Pekka is soon whisked away to the crazy, pretentious art world of New York. And it's just funny to, to watch this sort of thing. This kid who just wanted to take pictures because he loves it, all of a sudden he's this icon. I love how it parodies this pretentious art world. It's also worth noting how aggressive the art scene is when discovering new talent and it just pushes them and pushes them. You're like their latest project and as soon as someone decides they want out, they'll find another one that they'll get obsessed with. There are a few cameos in here as well. He also has a very quirky family which are really entertaining to watch and there are so many great lines. All famous, just like the Jackson family. Don't say that, Tina. But as bizarre and as unexpected as this movie is, it does have a really interesting and poignant message at its centre. So yeah, Pekka, check it out. Number three. High Art. This movie is kind of a hidden gem. This is the second photography related movie that came out in 1998. They were really digging that, weren't they? The movie follows Sid, who is an assistant editor at Frame Magazine. Sid eventually discovers that her neighbour is actually a famous photographer by the name of Lucy Berliner. Now choosing to stay away from the public eye, Lucy spends her time with her heroin addicted girlfriend Greta. 
and her apartment is used to entertain a ragtag group of wild child has-beens who just sit around taking drugs. After a chance encounter, Sid and Lucy bond over their love of photography and analysing the still image, and they eventually enter into a relationship. This movie was a lot more poignant than I thought it was going to be, and it really struck a chord with me. The ending in particular really shows you the importance of the still image and, and the magnitude of a photograph, particularly when your relationships and your connections with the other people surrounding you in that photograph change. They could have easily made the photographer an asshole, but she's not at all. She's this very tragic character. And it's also great to see photography in a movie where the LGBT community is also represented. So the 90s weren't the best time when portraying the LGBTQ community. They didn't write gay people the best. It was almost like, oh, they're gay and that's their character. So it was so refreshing to see a movie from the 90s that actually gave these people real humanity and characters and you felt like you were watching real people. So yeah, that's high art. Number four. One hour photo. This is a very different take on photography and the photographer. The late Robin Williams plays Sai, a photo technician who has a strange obsession with one particular family whose photos he has developed for years. This eventually leads to him stalking the family, trying to be a part of them, taking pictures of them, fantasizing about going into their house. It makes you feel uneasy. I've seen this movie a couple of times and each time I'm completely floored by Robin Williams' performance. This is a very different role. Yeah, this guy's got issues. <laughs> and the lengths that he will go to to be a part of this family is disturbing. The longer you watch the movie, the more disturbing it becomes, the more maniacal and desperate he gets. What I really like about this movie is the voyeurism, the idea of using the camera as a means to invade an environment without someone even knowing. And as deranged as he is, Sai also comes up with some really interesting points about photography. It takes on, instead of the person being stalked, it takes on the point of view of the stalker. You almost empathise with him. It is creepy though, and you will need something more light-hearted after. <laughs> Number five. The public eye. Another kind of hidden gem that isn't really talked about much. An homage to the 1940s noir gangster movies all centres around this one photographer who goes by the name of the Great Bernzini. Played by Joe Pesci, this character is clearly a Ouija-inspired character. And for those who don't know who Ouija is, Ouija was a 1940s photographer who would always arrive at crime scenes before the police or anyone else and he'd take pictures, often really graphic pictures. And the cool thing about this movie is the photographs used are actually Ouija's photos. I thought that was a really nice touch. But the great Bernzini, or Bernsey, goes around to these crime scenes. He's got this police radio monitor that he uses to arrive way before the cops. And he goes to great lengths to get these photos. He actually does some pretty shitty things. <laughs> like some really sleazy things to get a picture, like pretending to be a priest so he can see a dead body and photograph it, rearranging a corpse that's been murdered and placing the hat there because, oh, you know, the papers like to see the hat. It's grim, but it's funny. <laughs> and Joe Pesci just melts into the role. He's so, so good. This guy can do anything. He fixates on his subjects. Like, there are moments where he sees a street scene as if it were a photo, and it's so interesting to tap into that mindset because it, it kind of runs along the idea of the artistic compulsion. You know, he's the obsessed artist. So yeah, I really enjoyed this movie. Definitely watch it, especially if you're a Ouija fan. And if you don't know who Ouija is, I suggest you research him. He was a very interesting character from a bygone era. Number six. Fur, an imaginary portrait of Diane Arbus. Whilst not a historically accurate biography of the famous freak photographer Diane Arbus, I like what this movie did with its artistic licensing, if that makes sense. It is not meant to be taken seriously, and the movie does state at the very beginning that it is a fictional 
retelling. Diane Arbus was an iconic American photographer in the mid 20th century. She photographed the outcasts and the freaks that were hidden from society, they were not something you'd normally see. Diane Arbus is played by Nicole Kidman who is just so wonderful in this role. She really brings a lot of emotion and weight to a woman that never really feels like she's in the right place. She doesn't feel at home in 1950s New York in this fancy apartment with her husband who owns a photography business. She doesn't quite fit in and she knows that. The movie centres around Arbus developing a bizarre relationship with her mysterious upstairs neighbour named Lionel, played by Robert Downey Jr. Lionel suffers from hypertrichosis, a condition where abnormal amounts of hair grow on the body. Why should you watch this movie? Well, first of all, the film looks gorgeous. Like, I love these shots of this weird apartment with paint peeling off the walls and all these different things in the background. You really feel like you're being pulled into another world when you enter this apartment. The performances are also great. Nicole Kidman and Robert Downey Jr. are wonderful in their roles and you really begin to love them and empathise with them, particularly Lionel. He just broke my heart in this movie. <laughs> to this day, decades after her passing, Diane Arbus remains an icon. Even for the cinematography and performances alone, it's still definitely worth a viewing. Number seven. Everlasting Moments. Another film I didn't know about until recently. Set in the early 1900s, this Swedish film chronicles the life of Maria, a working class Finnish immigrant who wins a camera in a raffle and it changes the course of her entire life. She already has to deal with a very volatile marriage to a husband who becomes violent when he's drunk. She also has to deal with the stresses of raising so many children, trying to earn money when you're poor. There's a lot that she has to deal with and the camera is kind of a release you watch as this woman becomes more and more confident and more empowered. That being said, the movie doesn't shy away from some of the harsher realities of life in that area in that time. It covers the First World War, it covers poverty, people get sick, they pass away. So you really empathise with Maria. And the way she uses the camera as almost a catharsis and a release and an escape. And it's wonderful to see a movie that chronicles the early days of photography. You see these really ancient cameras and these techniques and they're just now learning more and more about it and it's so fascinating to see the processes of early photography. So yeah, check it out. Number eight. The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. Of course this film is on here, <laughs> how could it not be? It's such a great movie. This is one of my personal favourites and I could not do this list without mentioning this film. Ben Stiller stars as Walter Mitty, a negatives assets manager who works at Life magazine. He constantly spends his time daydreaming of adventures. He also fantasises about Cheryl Melhoff, a woman that he's been secretly in love with for a while who works with him at Life magazine. In the film, Life magazine is taken over by another company and they are switching it to being purely digital, so it's just all online, which means a lot of people are going to be losing their jobs and they are tasked with publishing the last physical copy of Life magazine. Walter is given the task of developing the cover for the final issue. He's been sent a very specific negative by photographer Sean O'Connell, played brilliantly by Sean Penn. However, there's one slight hitch the negative is actually missing. He can't find it anywhere. So Paul Walter has to retrace his steps and go on this crazy adventure to find the photographer in the hopes that he can find the negative. To say that the cinematography of this film is gorgeous is an understatement. There are some shots that just blow you away. The soundtrack as well, I love. Photographers especially need to watch this film as there is one moment that really, really strikes a chord. It struck a chord with me and the delivery is just really powerful and unexpected. I could go on and on about this film, I love it so much, but instead I'm just gonna shut up and let you guys watch it. So watch The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. You'll be glad you did. Number nine. Rear Window. 
I adore Alfred Hitchcock. I love his movies. So I was so excited when I realised I could include this film in this list. Released in 1954 in glorious Technicolor, this American suspense thriller film is set entirely in one apartment block. It's set in one courtyard overlooking different apartment windows, hence the name Rear Window. This movie stars James Stewart as a wheelchair-bound photographer after an accident involving him breaking his leg. So he's confined to this wheelchair and he becomes obsessed with spying on his neighbours. Using binoculars and telephoto lenses, he spies on them all day long. So during a particularly hot summer, this poor wheelchair-bound photographer one day becomes convinced that he's witnessed a murder. He is so convinced that one of the neighbours opposite his window on the other side of the courtyard has killed his wife and is hiding the evidence. He becomes so fixated that he gets involved and he gets his girlfriend, who's this glamorous socialite played by Grace Kelly, he gets her involved, he gets his nurse involved. It's honestly one of the most suspenseful movies I've ever watched. Particularly the ending, which just... I'm convinced I didn't breathe for about five minutes. <laughs> it's just so, so good. And what I love about this film, as well as the aspects of voyeurism and how far you can push it and how far do you take it, it also feels less like you're watching a movie and more like you're watching a play. You're just watching something in a theater and all these events unfolding before your very eyes. I would go even further than to say it feels like you're watching a play. It really does feel like you're just spying on your neighbors and then one day something really exciting happens and you, you just can't believe it and you can't leave it alone and you fixate on it. A lot of photography movies do revolve around this obsession and fixation, either with the camera or the voyeurism or the mystery involved with photography. It's incredibly suspenseful, the performances are fantastic, the shots are just so good. Hitchcock just was a mad genius right from the opening shot you know there are so many revolutionary shots in here and the fact that you can create such an exciting and engaging and suspenseful story that doesn't leave an apartment block courtyard is really impressive i can't get enough of alfred hitchcock's movies and this is definitely one of his finest number 10 city of god now talk about saving the best till last this celebrated brazilian movie is one of the best movies about photography there is. And even without the photography element, it is a damn good film. I remember way back when, the first time I watched this, I was unsure before I pressed play. I was kind of like, yeah, you know, I've heard a lot of hype about this movie. I don't wanna, you know, let's just watch it. Right from the first five minutes, I was completely hooked. This Brazilian crime film is set in the 1960s and 70s in the slums of Rio. This particular slum is known as the City of God, and it is one scary and dangerous place. The story follows Rocket from childhood to adulthood and his developing love for the camera. But it's not just about the camera, it's not just about the photography aspect, which does play a big part in it, particularly the end. It covers more the lives of the people in this slum and just how dangerous and terrifying it was in this time and still is in many cases. You don't really know who to trust because that person's on that one side but that person is friends with that person so we can't kill them but we can kill that person who's connected to them but if we do that then they'll be honest and it's just so many intricacies and layers to this film and you're so wrapped up in it. I was. I was just so hooked on this story and I remember the first time I watched it, it was really late at night and I needed to go to sleep, but I couldn't. I just I, I just had to watch it from start to finish and I had to see what happened. It's so engaging and unforgettable. The performances are fantastic. The characters are very real and relatable and scary, particularly Lil Zay, who is the, I guess you could say, the main antagonist of the movie. He has some issues. <laughs> but you can kind of see how he got them. And the same with our central protagonist, Rocket. He's this innocent kid that just wants to stay out of trouble, but at the same time he can't because of who his brother was and where he lives and what he does. And the fact that he has a camera and has captured pictures of all of this, it just makes it all the more dangerous and just moves the stakes up even higher. 
There's a lot going on, so you do have to pay attention and remember who's who. That is one thing. It's not for casual watching. This movie is definitely not something that you can just put on in the background and do work or be on your phone or whatever. You need to pay attention and you need to follow the movie because you could get lost so easily because there's so much going on. So that's it. I'm going to shut up about it now. <laughs> I don't want to overhype it too much. And I just, it's so good. <laughs> I can't help it, I'm sorry. So yeah, City of God. What else can I say except it's just a rush from beginning to end. So those are my 10 photography movies you need to check out. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I hope I haven't rambled too much about them. But you know what, I just really love talking about film and this is something I'd like to do more. So let me know if you'd like to hear more about that sort of thing. So check these movies out. I'd also love to know your thoughts on these movies. So comment below, tell me what you thought. If there are any that I have missed, I'm gonna do another list sometime soon, somewhere down the line of other movies that you should watch if you're a photographer. And as always, if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe and hit that bell for notifications. Also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I will also leave the links in the description below. I am in Ireland next week as of filming this, so I don't know what it's gonna be yet, but you <laughs> tune in next week and find out, I guess. Bye.